welcome back as we now begin to journey through the seven churches. Now, all these churches were located in Turkey and each of these churches had a specific message. Each of these churches had a specific encouragement. They had a correction in most cases, but also we see how Jesus introduces himself in the light of what they were going through. Now, as we read through these letters and as we begin to dissect them, we need to look at them from the context of the bridegroom speaking to his bride. And, and he's saying, I really love this about you. I am really encouraged about you in this man manner. But I also have this against you. See, Jesus is coming for an authentic bride. He's coming for a bride who is passionate and who is in love with him. He wants a bride who desires her bridegroom and not a hearsay bride. Okay, so we're going to first look at the church in Ephesus. Now, you would be familiar with the letter of Paul to even the church in Ephesus. You know, an amazing letter where there's so much of spiritual depth and revelation. Ephesus was known for the worship of Diana or Artemis. If you read the book of Acts in chapter 19, verses 24 to 41, you see how Paul visited uh, the city and he literally created a riot because there were people who gave up their practices of divination, their magic. They came and burnt all their books. And as a result, the silversmiths were threatened that their business would be hit because people were now turning to a God where they would not need an idol. You know, uh, the, the patron uh, God, goddess was Diana and she was associated with childbirth, with fertility and also the woods. And people believe that her that she could talk to woodland animals and even control their movements. And so you will see that in every city there was a patron god um, that was given the city over to. And to be honest, this is even true sometimes today. <clears throat> to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So right at the outset, Jesus is writing to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Now, the angel is not a divine being, right? Like Gabriel or like Michael, some of the angels that are mentioned in the Bible. But these are leaders of the churches. So the, the word there is that he's addressing the leadership of each church. He is introduced as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, from our previous uh, learning, we know that each lampstand represented each church. So there were seven lampstands and he's holding each star and each star again is the leaders of these churches. So Jesus is introducing himself to say, I am the Lord. I am the bridegroom who is amongst you. My presence is with you. I am not disconnected from the church, but I'm right in the presence of the church and I'm holding every leader up. I'm holding the leadership up and I am the one who speaks. That's encouraging to know that Jesus is in the midst of our churches today, no matter what we go through, no matter what we are facing. And he's holding up 
our leaders. You know, if you're a church leader, you know, know that Jesus is lifting you up. You are in his hands. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance. How you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Wow, that's a great encouragement. Jesus says, I know your works. He says, nothing is hidden from me. Remember, he's the one with the eyes like fire. So nothing is hidden from him. And he says, I know your works. So, you know, be encouraged because he knows everything that you are going through and everything that you do. He says, I know your toil, your patient endurance. In other words, you know, even through the suffering and the struggles, I know what you are going through. He says, you know, you cannot bear with those who are evil. He says, you know, people who are evil, you just hate them. You know, they, God hates evil. And he said, you know, you you are carrying that very heart of, of God. And, you know, that should be a quality of a church. A church should not entertain evil. And he says, you have tested all the false prophets and apostles. In every generation, there are false prophets. In every generation, there are false apostles, especially people who come and declare themselves to be a prophet or an apostle. And don't ever get deceived to think, oh gosh, I, sh I shouldn't even test them. I shouldn't, because the Bible says, test even all prophecy, test all things. So, you know, you test people who, whom, who have not grown up with you, whom you have not seen the giftings, whom you have not seen, you know, the anointing of God on them. You know, you, it is your right to, test them and to prove them whether they are genuine or not. So as the church, make it your practice to test even those who randomly walk up and say, I am so and so, because you have to safeguard yourself and the bride of Christ. And Jesus then also encourages them and says, you have not grown weary. You're not grown tired. You are tenacious. You are enthusiastic. You are persevering and you have not become weary. You're not tired of what you are doing. There's a zeal in what you are doing. And so there's a great encouragement that has come to the church from the Lord. Verse 4 says, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. You know, he encouraged them and said, you know, your works, you know, everything that you do is, is, is great. You know, you, you have not grown weary, but I have this one thing. And he says, you have fallen away and abandoned your first love. The first love is the love and the passion and the intimacy they had for Christ. Because works and busyness had got in the way. Their time in the presence of God, their intimacy with Jesus, hearing his voice, you know, walking, being led of the spirit was no more. See, when we move away from our first love, when we move away from the love of God in our hearts, the things we do, it just becomes a routine. It becomes a task. See, ministry should not be a task, but ministry has to be led and flowed out of the presence of God, out of intimacy, out of relationship. And so these people had got so involved in doing things, but they had forgotten and they had moved away 
from their first love and their love for Jesus. You know, yes, it is possible that you can be doing things for Jesus, but you may not be being in his presence. And so therefore, Jesus was saying, return back to your first love, the outflow of our intimacy with Christ. You know, Romans chapter five says how the Holy Spirit pours in the love of God into our hearts. And so if we don't have God's love in our hearts, in the things that we do, we may be ending up complaining, grumbling, murmuring, you know, bickering with one another, speaking against one another. And there becomes a atmosphere of unpleasantness. So Jesus is saying, immediately repent. And this is a serious thing for him because the bridegroom wants a bride who loves him, that he becomes her priority. He becomes her first love, not something else, not the house, not the church, not the ministry. But Jesus becomes her priority, her love, her life, her everything, her being. And therefore, he's saying, repent. If not, I will come and remove your lampstand. Now, that is serious. He's saying, I will remove you from even, if I may go to the extent to say, the existence of representing me. I'm going to remove your light. I'm going to remove you because without my intimacy, without my love there, what you're doing is of no use is that what we do flows out of the intimacy and love we have in Christ. And he says, you know, repent. Repentance is good. And you will see that in most of the churches, he's asking the churches to repent, to turn back, to change their ways and to come back to him, to align themselves so that they are now walking and in unity with him. Come back to the place of intimacy. Come back to your first love. And that is the message even to the church of this day and age. That we have to be flowing out of the love of God and out of an intimacy with him. Relationship with him comes first. And then we do things for him with him. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, who are the Nicolaitans? It is said that they were a sect or a cult, and they preached a false doctrine, which caused people who were following the Lord to fall away through idolatry, through sexual immorality. And they literally would mix current religious practices in the city with Christianity. And so they would come and they would, you know, say, you know, it's OK to do both. It's OK to worship Diana. It's OK to, you know, go our way. And whilst also you're following Christ. But we know that that is not okay because Jesus wants a bride who is committed, dedicated, wholehearted for him. We cannot have spiritual adultery happening, but he wants a bride who's all in love with him and him alone. And the reward for overcoming the reward for repenting and turning back. He says, I will give you eternal blessings to eat from the tree of life. He's saying you will have eternal life if you begin to change. If you change, there will be eternal blessings for you as you are given to eat of the tree of life. So that is the message to the first church. 
and it, it is interesting, it begins with love. God is love and everything we do has to be out of that love. Daily we need to allow him to pour his love into us and we function out of that love. We can do all the good tasks, all the right things. We can say all the right things. But if we do not have intimacy, what good would that be?